welcome back to an introduction to paleontology with the Safe Cultural Heritage Group. This is week four and it is on the rise and fall of dinosaurs. So in today's lesson you will learn what dinosaurs were, the key dates, paleogeography and paleoclimate, key fauna, cultural depictions of dinosaurs, theropod to bird evolution and the end Cretaceous mass extinction. So to begin with, what are dinosaurs? Dinosaurs are a group of reptiles of the clade Dinosauria and when translated, Dinosauria means the terrible lizards. They first appeared in the Triassic, but were not dominant organisms until after the Triassic-Jurassic extinction. And um, the clade does not include the pterosaurs or the marine reptiles, such as ichthyosaurs, pliosaurs and plesiosaurs, all of which were around at the same time as the dinosaurs. The only extant species of dinosaurs, however, are the birds. So what makes a dinosaur? All dinosaurs have, unless they've been secondarily lost, all of these features. So an erect gait with the femur held vertical and the femoral head offset at an angle. So um, if you look at modern reptiles today, so the sprawling is what a lizard has, semi-erect is what crocodiles have, and erect are what dinosaurs have, and as well as modern mammals. So the sprawling gait means that they move kind of one at a time diagonally. Semi-erect means that they would use the sprawling, however, they can use erect at the same time, and then erect is standing up and you move kind of how we would move today. Another one is an ilium with a posterior brevis shelf. So the brevis shelf is a area where muscles attach, and this is um, where the tail would have attached in dinosaurs. So another one is a femur with a curved shaft, as you can see quite nicely here when compared to a human femur. Um, another one is a humerus with an elongate crest as well, you can see really well on the pictures. And these are for the attaching deltoral muscles, deltopectoral muscles, so these are these ones here. Um, and an ascending process of the astragalus. So the astragalus in paleontology and um, paleontological term is the ankle bone, it's one of the ankle bones. And in dinosaurs, it kind of makes a triangular um, shape and it attaches towards the it attaches to the tibia. So as seen in this image here, it's kind of sub-triangular and it is fused to the tibia. Um, another one, and the final one, is the broad distal end of the tibia, um, as you can see really well on this Allosaurus bone here. And this is somewhat debated, so this is one of the kind of ish factors. So there are two major subclades of the dinosaurs and they are primarily divided by the pelvic structure as well as other skeletal factors. However, it's more commonly known from the pelvic structure. So we have two types. We have the Saurischians, which are the reptile hips, and the Ornithischians, which are the bird hips. Hipped. So um, the Saurischian is the more primitive out of the two pelvic structures. And this is where the pubis bone points um, forwards and the um, ischium points backwards. Whereas with the ornithischian pelvis, um, the pubis runs parallel to the ischium. And so with saurischian dinosaurs, there are three main taxa, the theropoda, prosauropoda, and the sauropoda. And these were present in the late Triassic to present. So birds are derived from the lizard hipped dinosaurs and not from the bird hipped dinosaurs, which is, quite confusing but it it's it's weird it's a weird sort of thing that's happened in paleontology so theropoda is the sister taxon to sauropodomorpha which are the sauropods and it's the most differentiated differentiated group amongst the saurischians which this is because of the high diversity of birds that we have today as well as all the dinosaur fossils of the theropods and then we also have the ornithischian dinosaurs, and these include all non-avian dinosaurs. They were primarily herbivorous, and they include the kind of prey species that we see in a lot of TV and films, so such as the triceratops, um, stegosaurus, ankylosaurs, and hadrosaurs. And these first evolved in the early Jurassic, and they died out sadly at the end of the Cretaceous. And the exact placement of ornithischia within the dinosaur li lineage is an issue, and we can see why here. So the phylogeny of dinosaurs is constantly being changed and rearranged and um, this one caused quite a big stir within the paleontological community and this was done by Byron et al in 2017 and what they did was they rearranged the phylogenetic tree and they stated that this was because some theropods were more closely related to ornithischians 
And this was united in um, a new clade known as Ornithoscalida. And this caused quite a big stir in the paleontological community with quite a lot of rebuttals, quite a lot of people in favour of it. So it's, it's an ever-changing, constant debate of the phylogeny. Um, so the key dates of um, dinosaur um, like running the world was the Mesozoic. And the Mesozoic means the middle life, and it spanned roughly 186 million years. Um, it's also known as the age of reptiles. So um, this was a phrase that was called, coined by Gideon Mantell in the 19th century. Gideon Mantell is known as Darwin's bulldog. And um, this was kind of during the 19th century when dinosaurs were being discovered. Um, so the Mesozoic contains three different um, periods. So we have the Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous. And um, this began after the Permo-Triassic mass extinction and it ended with the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction. So it started and ended with extinctions. So the Triassic um, was 251.9 to 201.3 million years, and it spanned roughly 50.6 million years. So both the start and the end of the Triassic were marked by major extinction events, and the Permian mass extinction, which um, was it's one of the biggest mass extinctions that ever happened on Earth, and it wiped out around 80-90% to of marine life and around 70% of terrestrial life. So, during the Triassic, the first true mammals evolved, the first vertebrates that flied, the pterosaurs also evolved, as well as dinosaur evolution. And um, during the Triassic, the fauna was dominated primarily by rhynchosaurs, which is this little guy over here on the right, um, and they are not really related to dinosaurs. Uh, so the paleogeography and climate, so almost all of the Earth's landmass was concentrated into Pangaea, uh, which was centred at the equator and spanned from pole to pole. The Quite a few rifting events happened during the late Triassic, but um, Pangaea had not separated by then. And we know this, um, there was a group of northern continents known as Laurasia, which includes America, Europe and Asia, and the group of southern continents known as Gondwana, which include like South, Af uh, South Africa, South America, Africa, Asia, and uh, not Asia, Australia, and India. Um, and the Triassic climate was mainly, um, so it was a transition period between the ice house and greenhouse climate. So that went, meant that it went from extremely cold to extremely warm. And it's known that there were desert belts around 10 to 30 degrees latitude. And um, due to the position, uh, positioning of Pangaea, as well as the ocean surrounding it, it's thought that there was quite a monsoonal climate. So here we have three different maps from um, Scotties. He creates a big, he has a paleo map project, and it shows the early Triassic, the middle Triassic, and the late Triassic. So as you can see here, there was a rise and fall of sea levels, as well as um, you can see um, Pangaea just massive supercontinent. Uh, so dinosaurs in the Triassic, the oldest known dinosaurs were Eera well, are Eoraptor, Herrerasaurus and Saturnalia. And these are Carnian aged, which is late Triassic. And um, this was 237 to 228 million years ago. And these dinosaurs were small and bipedal. Um, and the most common late Triassic dinosaur was known as Plateosaurus, and that is 214 to 204 million years ago. I understand that you can't really see the head bit of this of this dinosaur, but I will put that on the, it's on the handout. So it's a basal sauropodomorph dinosaur, and it was around seven meters long, so it's quite a big dinosaur for the time. And it was thought originally that it could have been bipedal or quadrupedal, however, a study done in 2010 found that Plateosaurus could not have bore its weight on its front legs, so it meant that it had to be bipedal. And it's thought that they were herbivores because their teeth have quite herbivorous characteristics, as well as um, the fact that they have chewed, they would have chewed sideways like a cow, uh, they couldn't have chewed sideways like a cow does, so they would have just had to swallow it whole. So the Jurassic is kind of the most well-known periods in 
the Mesozoic. And this was 201.3 to 145 million years ago. So the Jurassic began with the Triassic-Jurassic extinction event, which was associated with the eruption of the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. So this is kind of when the Atlantic Ocean started to form. And the way that oceans form is that mid-ocean ridges open, which causes... Um, volcanoes to erupt, and it means that land is spread outwards. Um, the fauna was dominated by dinosaurs, however we've, st we've got the first birds um, that appeared during the tra Jurassic, but pterosaurs were still the most dominant flying vertebrates at the time. We also have the first appearance of um, the earliest like modern lizards, and the evolution of theory in mammals, which is what we are. The ocean fauna was dominated by marine reptiles such as ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. So the paleogeography and climate, the, during the start of the Jurassic, Pangaea began to break up and this was accelerated by the North Atlantic opening between Europe and Africa. Um, that should say America, <laughs> sorry. Laurasia broke up into North America and Eurasia and then Gondwana began to break up by the mid-Jurassic. Um, the continents were formed by the Panthalatic Ocean and um, Continents were surrounded by the Pantalatic Ocean, with the Tethys Ocean forming between Laurasia and Gondwana, um, which meant that sea levels rose. And during the Jurassic, the climate was a lot moister than the Triassic, and there was warmer conditions in the polar regions. And we know that the polar regions were warm. This is due to the presence of fern and conifer fossils that have been found in Antarctica. So here again we have some Jurassic paleogeography and as you can see in the map we have um, oceans beginning to form as well as the break of Pangaea by the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary as well as in the middle Jurassic. So dinosaurs in the Jurassic. So the largest herbivores were dominated by sauropods and um, we also get the earliest avialands which include birds and their ancestors and these appear during the middle to late tri uh, Jurassic. And this is known by um, through fossils such as Archaeopteryx. This was the first like bird fossil found, and this was found in the Solenhofen limestone of Germany. The earliest definitive ornithischians appear during the early Jurassic, which are represented by basal ornithischians like Lithosaurus and Heterodontosaurus, as well as early members of the Thyreophorans which um, are ankylosaurs and stegosaurs. So the earliest members of the Thyrophorians begin to appear during the Middle Jurassic. So here we have some key examples. So um, our sort of main understanding is of the fossil faunas come from America, which I'll um, talk about in a bit. So we have um, examples such as Allosaurus, Stegosaurus, Brachiosaurus and Diplodocus. So the Cretaceous is another one of the better of the well-known um, well periods during the Mesozoic. And this was 251.9 to 66 million years ago, and it was roughly around 80 million years long. And this is the longest geological period of the entire Phanerozoic. So from the Cambrian up until now, this was the longest geological period. So the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary is the only boundary to lack a defined global boundary uh, stratotype section and point. So these are points that ge uh, geologists use to be able to accurately date and um, kind of point out the boundaries between different um, time periods. And this is because the Jurassic and the Cretaceous is really hard to define in the rock record. So during the Cretaceous, dinosaurs were still the most dominant animals on the planet. And then we also get the evolution of many modern animals, including the placental mammals and the marsupials. Um, as well as this, during the early Cretaceous, angiosperms, which are the flowering plants, appeared, um, with the first one appearing roughly 122 million years ago. And these angiosperms then um, diversified, which replaced the already sort of established gymnosperms, which are the non-flowering plants. Um, and then the end of the Cretaceous is defined by the Cretaceous Paleogene Mass Extinction, which is also known as the KPG. K being Cretaceous in German, and um, this is to kind of sort of avoid any confusion with other um, time periods that, are, that begin with a C, such as the Cambrian and Crata uh, Carboniferous. 
And during this mass extinction, about three, um, three quarters of the plant and animal life um, species on Earth died. So um, these primarily were the non-avian dinosaurs, pterosaurs and marine reptiles, as well as other invertebrates. So the paleogeography and climate. So Pangaea had completely broken up by this point. And um, Gondwana started to rift apart as well. So South America, Antarctica and Australia all rifted away from Africa. And um, India and Madagascar kind of remained attached to each other until around 80 million years ago when India started to drift up to its present day. Um, configuration. So the mid and late Cretaceous there was extremely high sea levels which was over 100 meters um, higher than they are today due to mid-ocean ridges rising the seafloor levels. This meant that like different continents got um, divided up and had extra sea levels so um, North America was divided by um, a uh, seaway known as the Western Interior Seaway. Europe was a series of small islands and um, as well, we also got flooding and oceanic transgressions, which also occurred in South America and Africa. At the peak of its um, transgression, one third of Earth's present land area was submerged, and this led to large amount of chalks being deposited. Deposited. The climate of the Cretaceous is debated as to whether it was warm or not, and um, isotopic data suggests that there was warm temperatures in the late tri uh, Jurassic and most of the Cretaceous. And then there was a major cooling trend in the latest uh, Cretaceous. And this is shown by rainforests being preserved in Antarctica. And here we have two examples of um, paleo maps. So um, as you can see here, the high sea levels in the early Cretaceous, known as the, um, during the late Albion. And you can see like the sea level transgression that cut off quite a lot of landmass. And then by the late Cretaceous, this had sort of gone down a bit. Um, so dinosaurs in Cretaceous, they are probably the best known dinosaurs. So they, um, at the start of the Cretaceous, we had a mix of Jurassic-like species as well as newer forms. And um, the dinosaurs of the last 10 million years of the Cretaceous from North America are some of the best known in the world. And this includes examples such as T-Rex and Triceratops. By the end of the Jurassic, some of the large sauropods, such as Diplodocus, um, went extinct, and these were replaced by species such as the Titanosaurs. And um, Ornithischians, so for Ornithischians, quite a lot of um, hadrosaurs became an, uh, diversified during the Cretaceous. So here we have a few examples. We have T-Rex, uh, one of the best-known dinosaurs, Titanosaur, Iguanodon, which is a hadrosaur, Velociraptor and Triceratops. So there are a lot of biases surrounding dinosaur paleontology. So as mentioned in a few slides ago, we uh, that the dinosaurs of North America are one of the best known dinosaur faunas. So this is because pa uh, dinosaur paleontology was heavily biased towards Western paleontology. So this was because of funding as well as like interest. And then within the last 30 years or so, uh, focus has now shifted onto Asia, in primarily China, Africa, primarily Morocco, as well as Australia. And um, another bias that we come across is identification bias. So this is when collectors create new dinosaur species of, or genera. And um, this could be kind of changed because um, these specimens were, an, um, were could be just a juvenile species of um, juvenile specimens of a known dinosaur species. So this is quite an, like a good example is um, the um, oh, Nano T Rex, na Nano Tyrannus. That's what it's called. And this was created by a amateur paleontologist, and he's got a show on like Discovery or something, and. What it is, is that Nanotyrannus is not a valid genus or a species, it is actually just a juvenile specimen of T. rex, is what the uh, professional paleontologists think. Another um, bias surrounding paleo dinosaur paleontology is the academic versus commercial biases. So a key example of this was Sue the T. rex, and a more recent one is Stan the T. rex, which is on the right here. So Stan the T. rex is a cast uh, on, on the right here is a cast of the actual fossil and that's uh, shown at Manchester Museum. That was the main T-Rex fossil that I saw as a kid and I always thought it was so cool. So 
More recently, Stan the T-Rex sold at auction for $31.8 million. Probably, it's, it's one of the highest numbers that have sold for um, fossils. So, um, da David Evans of the Royal Ontario Museum in Canada states that if this kind of money, aka the $31.8 million, was invested properly, it could easily fund 15 permanent dinosaur research positions or about 80 full field ex expeditions a year. So that money could have gone to a lot better things than just having a T-Rex. So what paleontologists feared when Stan the T-Rex went up for auction was that it was going to be bought by a private collector, which, collector, which is what probably happened. And this could mean that the researchers and public could lose access to the fossil, meaning that the like ability to repeat results, such as measurements of the bones or new analyses with more advanced tools, could not be completed. Um, which is, it sucks, you know, like, it really does suck the fact that this is just going to be in someone's home. And um, another one is, another key bias is the, um, like, the data and like who who does it all so here we have this really useful example of um jurassic dinosaur entries and cretaceous dinosaur entries for the um for this really cool website called the paleobiology database and there are quite a lot of biases when it comes to this because this is a people who use this b it's a case of more as you can see there's quite a lot of discrepancies so not many as uh, not many dinosaurs as found in um, Asia as well as Africa compared to in the Jurassic you know it, it there's a lot of biases going on within paleobiology with da um, dinosaur paleobiology so the cultural depictions of dinosaurs the cultural depictions um, have created as well as or reinforcing misconceptions about dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals. So a key example is that different extinct animals, such as di um, Demetrodon, which is from the Permian, as well as woolly mammoths, which are the Pleistocene, and Neanderthals, aka cave people, from, also from the Pleistocene, live together with dinosaurs. So there are quite a lot of movies and TV shows where humans live together with dinosaurs. Um, another key example is Jurassic Park. So as much as I love Jurassic Park, there are a lot of problems which are gradually being rectified. So, aka the feathers on the dinosaurs, that is a kind of big talking point at the moment with the most recent Jurassic World coming out. Another one is the Velociraptors. Velociraptors are, in the show, supposed to be the size of Dionychus um, instead of their actual size, which was about the size of a turkey. As well as this Dilophosaurus, the spitty venom one, um, was um, actually a lot smaller than its original size in the film. So Dilophosaurus was around 1.2 meters tall in the film, which was a lot smaller than what they actually were. As well as this, the dinosaurs like Dilophosaurus could spit venom. That isn't paleontologically accurate. And then finally, that we can extract dinosaur DNA from mosquitoes. As cool as that would be, it just wouldn't work. And the final example is that dinosaurs were featherless, slow-moving, scaled, roaring organisms. These are common misconceptions that we aim to kind of de debunk almost. Um, so here are some examples. There's the Dilophosaurus on the top left. That's the one where they spit venom out, which wasn't true. Um, another one is humans with dinosaurs. And then this on the right here was the was an old version of a T-Rex and like what it would have looked like. And then this bottom um, picture here shows the Jurassic Park Velociraptor compared to its actual size as well as Dionychus, which is its closest cousin. So as you can see, there's a lot of paleontological errors going on in Jurassic Park. So now we move to bird evolution. So birds evolved from a from these um, from small theropods. So not the large ones like T-Rex. Um, they are from the um, the group Maniraptora, which includes dromaeosaurs and truodonts, and um, is also it's also known as Paravies. So um, for a few centuries, Archaeopteryx was considered to be the earliest bird. Um, however, more transitional fossils have since been found, and these are quite a lot of the new species are from China. 
So, um, birds, um, so birds evolved from theropods around 165 to 150 million years ago, so during the Middle and Late Trias uh, Jurassic. And then they diversified through the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. Um, with Archaeopteryx, the original idea that birds came from dinosaurs was, um, it kind of came about only a few years after Darwin's Origin of Species, um, around 1861, and that is when um, the first Archaeopteryx fossils were found. And then, and kind of further forward in time, John Ostrom, he found Dionychus in America, and then more recently these Chinese fossils have come about, and these fossils all have feathers, which is really, really cool. So the oldest birds and their relatives were small, roughly about chicken size, lightweight, long-armed, winged, and they were also feathered. So the birds diversified mainly during the Cretaceous, and this is recorded by fossils of the J from the J-hole biota in China, uh, which is a lagostatin, and it is a like an ashfall, um, also lacustrine, which is lake environments. And um, the J-hole biota is roughly 130.7 to 120 million years old. So the J-hole localities have yielded thousands of complete and fully articulated skeletons, and it includes a mixture of advanced and ancient species, both both kind of Jurassic drag-alongs into the Cretaceous as well as Cretaceous. And the um, some of the species are the oldest unequivocal avian fossils after Archaeopteryx. Um, so these actually, some of them were actually uh, dated to pre-Archaeopteryx. Um, and j hold bird fauna accounts for roughly a half of the total recorded global diversity of Mesozoic bird species. And the true modern birds, which are members of the crown group Neornithes, are mostly from the post-Cretaceous radiation of birds. However, there is some fossil evidence of Cretaceous species of the Neornithes. And here we have a really kind of pixelated example of the J-hole formation. So we have, um, they are immaculately preserved fossils, which I was lucky to see during the Dinosaurs of China exhibit in 2017. And this was at Wollaton Hall in Nottingham, the UK. So I was able to see these fossils and um, of these organisms such as Microraptor, and Sinoceropteryx, so these are all my own photos. And as you can see here, they have beautiful feathers um, here as well with Yiki, Yaonis, and Confucianus. As you can see, all of these bird fossils have feathers and they are just beautiful. <laughs> I just don't know how, how else to explain it, really. Um, and then, so what came first, the chicken or the feather? Feathered dinosaurs were found in China in 1996 in the J-hole biota. So it's now thought that simple feathers had evolved further down the evolutionary tree. Um, and this raised two questions. How many dinosaurs had feathers and what were the original functions of the feathers? Um, so feather-like structures have also been found in other dinosaur clades, such as the Ceratopsian Psittacosaurus, which is on the right here. And as you can see, there are small bristles on its tail. So the feathered dinosaurs from China that uh, confirm feathers evolved in the earliest celiosaurs. And celiosaurs are species such as Compsognathus, Tyrannosaurs, Ornithomimosaurs, as well as the Maniraptorans. And it's thought that the first, fo uh, the first feathers used in celiosaurs are, were short fi filaments that were probably used for insulation as well as or display. And Small paravians used feathered forewings and hindwings in flight by the late Jurassic early Cretaceous. So that meant that by the late Jurassic we had flying birds. Um, so now we move on to the end Cretaceous mass extinction or the KPG. And um, we were able to date the KPG boundary using magnetostratigraphy as well as radiometric dating. So magnetostratigraphy is when the polarity of the Earth's magnetic field is recorded in rocks that contain iron-bearing minerals. So quite a lot of the time this is igneous rocks which are um, not fossil-bearing and it found that the extinction only lasted around 0.5 million years. 
And then radiometric dating, we used argon argon dating, so we used different isotopes of argon to be able to date fossils, um, and as well as um, like ashes of volcanoes. And for this mass extinction boundary, we used the ashes at the KPG boundary, and it dated the extinction to 66.032 plus or minus 0.058 million years, um, which meant that instead of it being 65 million years ago that everyone thought it was, it's now 66 million years ago. And there's still quite a bit of debate as to what caused the mass extinction. Um, however, it's one of the most studied points in geological time. So it's a bit weird that there's still these debates going on, um, but um, we've kind of come to the conclusion that it was a meteor impact. So this is the one that's most commonly accepted. So this meteorite impact was first proposed by Alvarez et al in 1980, and it's based on iridium layers that were found in KPG layers in Italy and Denmark. And it's now, this iridium layer was around 30 times greater than um, average iridium layers um, in, in rocks. And it's now been found in numerous sections worldwide. So the kind of thing that the meteorite impact that kind of matched up to this was the Chicxulub crater in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. This impact crater, um, it was kind of dated towards um, that age as well. And it's from an, uh, from an asteroid that was about 10 kilometers in diameter. That was massive. Uh, the crater is 195 kilometers in diameter as well as 20 kilometers in depth. And it's filled with Cenozoic sediments, which means that it would have had to have formed before the Cenozoic, which is the um, time period after the Mesozoic. And a 2020 study concluded that the Chicxulub crater was formed by an inclined 45 to 60 degrees, so about that kind of angle, um, to horizontal impact from the northeast. Um, there are four pieces of evidence that a meteorite impact had occurred at KPG boundary. So this first one is the iridium layer, which is found in numerous sections worldwide. And um, iridium is a platinum group element that is rare on the Earth's crust, and um, it reaches the Earth from space. So we know that it had to have come from a meteorite. Um, and there is a spike within the geological record of um, iridium. So the second one is shocked quartz. So quartz doesn't usually have this uh, sort of scratchiness to it, really. And it's been found in numerous sections close to the impact site. And um, these grains of quartz are crisscrossed, really. And that is due to the pressure of the impact. The third piece of evidence is um, glassy spherules, which are, um, it's like, glass that is formed because of the meteorite impact and these are found at the base of the boundary of the Cretaceous and Paleogene and um, this was produced by the rock melting beneath the crater and then they were chucked up through the air as the aftershock of the impact. And then finally is the fern spike. So this is found in numerous terrestrial boundary sections and this is the like abrupt shift in pollen ratios to um, from angiosperm, which are the flowering plants, to the gymnosperms, so such as uh, ferns. And this is because ferns are one of the first plants that can recover quickly after um, ex not extinction events, but like um, bad things, so such as forest fires. They're one of the first plants to recover. Um, as well as volcanic eruptions. So during the 1980 um, Mount St. Helens eruption, ferns were one of the first plants to kind of come back after the volcanic eruption. Um, alongside this, we also have examples of tsunami events happening in um, kind of marine sediments around the um, the crater impact site as well. So that's really cool. We have all these pieces of evidence that a meteorite impact had occurred. Oh. So we have also other suggestions, uh, one being volcanic activity. So um, during the KPG boundary, we also had the Deccan traps in India um, 
erupting and there were three different pulses um, spanning this boundary. And most people accept that large igneous provinces such as the Decon Traps uh, were the cause of other mass extinctions such as the Permo-Triassic and the Entriatic extinction. And then finally another suggestion was multiple causes. So the decline of dinosaurs and other taxa lasted around the last five to ten million years of late Cretaceous. So some people believe that dinosaurs were kind of already declining, which kind of, it, it's an interesting point. And this is due primarily due to the cooling climate, as well as um, other processes such as the death and trap. And then the kind of um, thing that ended it all was the asteroid. So um, there was been debate about whether dinosaurs were flourishing or if they'd already kind of were in decline towards the mass extinction event, and then this mass, then this meteorite impact would have wiped them out regardless. And um, this was done in 2019. Um, a team of researchers from Imperial University College London and the University of Bristol in the UK modelled the environmental changes in dinosaur species distribution if, in the North America um, dinosaur fauna. And they found that the dinosaurs were not in decline before the meteorite hit. And then this study found that the changing conditions for fossilisation, so the different environments that organisms could be um, fossilised in, meant that um, the previous analysis of the number of dinosaur species may have been underestimated, meaning that these dinosaurs just were not getting fossilised, which meant that there could have been a lot more around than we think. Um, so I will include the reference and the further readings on a separate sheet and here are my contacts if you need me. Uh, I might not be available next week due to um, a wedding that I will be at so I will be checking the um, Google Classroom but yeah so I look forward to hearing from you all soon.